Well, thank you, Marie Colette, for the kind introduction, and thanks to the organizers for the kind invitation and for everything, including the fine weather, of course. Random hyperplane tessellations are, of course, a classical subject of stochastic geometry. In the pioneering work of Roger Miles and uh, Georges Madron, they played an essential role, but I hope that still uh, one can make some modest remarks on these, which are not so ancient. So what we talk about, the topic are tessellations, more precisely induced by stationary Poisson hyperplane processes. And then in the end, the spherical or conical counterpart, tessellations of space, let's say, induced by random hyperplanes, finitely many random hyperplanes through the origin. And I consider this from a geometric viewpoint. So as a pure geometer, geometer I would ask questions for, their, for the sake of their geometric beauty and get useless results as a rule. Uh, essentially, I would like to ask for shapes and sizes of the induced random polytopes, sizes in the sense of measuring size by some geometric functionals. So let me first uh, show some pictures. This is meant to be a small, very small part of an isotropic Poisson line process. And uh, it can also look like this, so directions may be preferred, some directions. Even this is not excluded, where we have only uh, two directions. And uh, in higher dimensions, this is taken from some literature. It need not look so regular. And as far as, I didn't produce these pictures. As far as I remember, this goes back to Claudia Redenbach, I think. And uh, this is, looks like coming from the internet, and indeed it does. But you get an uh, impression of what I will be talking about. And uh, this I owe to Daniel Hook. I, I'm not sure who produced it. So this is uh, concerning my last point, where we consider Tessellations of the sphere by great subspheres, or equivalently, tessellation of space into cones by hyperplanes through the origin. Uh, so the program would be some necessary explanations in the beginning, then which shapes do occur at all. Then uh, just a brief reminder of uh, typical cells and typical K faces of our random mosaics. A very brief, well, when I talk about shapes, I must recall shapes of large cells, and uh, I, I restrict myself to a very brief survey here. And the main points then will be variances, in particular of the vertex number, and uh, finally the spherical counterparts, random cones. So this roughly is the program. Uh, the necessary explanations begin with hyperplanes, which I prefer to represent uh, by a unit normal vector. So this you is the uh, orthogonal hyperplane through the origin. And this is translated in the direction of u by parameter t. So we can represent every hyperplane in this way with a unit vector in the unit sphere and a real number t. Uh, script HD is the space of hyperplanes in RD equipped with the usual topology. Now, uh, I would like to consider point processes in the space of hyperplanes and only simple point processes, so I don't uh, model them by counting measures. I say, just say a hyperplane process X is a measurable mapping from some probability space into the measurable space of locally finite subsets of the space of hyperplanes with a suitable sigma algebra, which I don't repeat here. The essential notion is the intensity measure, of course, defined by uh, given a Borel set. So this curly B is always the set sigma algebra of Borel sets. Now in the space of hyperplanes, in the topological space of hyperplanes, we are given a Borel set and we count the number of hyperplanes of our process falling into this set. 
and the expectation of this random variable is capital theta of A. This gives us a measure, which is the intensity measure. And uh, as you all know, and as has been repeated several times, X is a stationary Poisson process if its uh, intensity measure is translation invariant. Now, this is a measure on the space of hyperplanes, of course, but translations operate also on the hyperplanes. And we assume that it is locally finite and uh, not identically zero. And then we assume that the counting variable has a Poisson distribution as usual with parameter given by the value of the intensity measure at the set A. Uh, usually it's part of the definition that the restrictions of X to pairwise disjoint sets are stochastically independent. Uh, for uh, simple processes, this would follow, but uh, I repeated it because it's, of course, very important in the following, these independence properties. So if the intensity measure is also invariant under rotations, then we say the process is isotropic, and then uh, the whole distribution, of course, is invariant under rigid motions. Now, in, in the pictures, you all uh, already have seen that the distribution properties of the directions of the hyperplanes in the process will be, play an essential role, of course, from the geometric point of view, this is a very essential point, which directions appear and how many do they appear. And this is ruled by the so-called directional distribution. And we get it if we exploit the translation invariance, uh, the translation invariance of the intensity measure. Namely, this leads to a decomposition of this kind. We just, uh, we just, take a fixed unit vector and uh, the corresponding hyperplanes are translated and we count when this hyperplane falls into the given argument set and then this is integrated over all t and in the end this is integrated over all directions and the theorem says that there is such a representation with a constant positive constant here and an even probability measure phi on the unit sphere here. So I've repeated this on the next slide. Uh, gamma is the intensity of X and phi is the directional distribution. So I repeat, it's an even probability measure on the unit sphere. And we assume now that it is not concentrated on the great subsphere. In this case, we would also say that the process is uh, non-degenerate. And here is the intuitive meaning of the directional distribution uh, given a Borel set now on the unit sphere. Uh, we count how many hyperplanes in the process are there with normal unit normal vector in A and the distance parameter between 0 and 1. And we take the expectation of this and divide by the expectations of the total number of hyperplanes with, these, with this parameter restriction. And this quotient gives us phi of A. So this is an intuitive the intuitive meaning of the directional distribution. Now, which shapes occur? Gener very generally. We consider a stationary Poisson hyperplane process with directional distribution given. And with probability one, this will induce a tessellation of Euclidean space into compact convex polytopes. We call this the mosaic induced by X, denoted by M sub X. And if in the first question, we are generally interested in its cells or d-dimensional polytopes, later also in its k phases, the k phases of the mosaic. And with probability one, every cell is a simple polytope. And are there any other restrictions would be our first question, because we are geometrically interested in shapes. So are there further restrictions? Well, of course, in this case, obviously, all the cells are rectangles for this particular uh, directional distribution. But what in this case, are there, so this is meant to be isotropic, are there any restrictions? So, of course, in these very small pictures, you see at most hexagons, I guess. I didn't look very carefully. But far out, would there be a polygon with a million vertices? Well, why not? But as far as I know, it has uh, never been proved, and so uh, together with uh, 
Matthias Reitzner, we recently considered this question, of course, in higher dimensions. And uh, as the example of the parallel process shows, we must have some restrictions on the directional distribution. So we assume that the support of the directional distribution is the whole unit sphere, and that phi or phi assigns measure zero to each great subsphere. So this would be satisfied, for example, by the isotropic distribution, where phi is just the normalized spherical Lebesgue measure. So and under this assumption, everything which is not forbidden can appear. Of course, the polytopes, as I say, are simple polytopes. The cells are simple polytopes. So uh, to say something about their shapes, we uh, might say which convex bodies can be approximated by them. And for that reason, I denote by KD the space of convex bodies with a Hausdorff metric. And then we have here the following result. If the assumption star is satisfied, then with probability one, the set of all translates of the cell is dense in the space of convex bodies. So if you give, I give you a realization, so with probability one, you can take any convex body and you will find a sequence of cells in your mosaic which properly translated approximate your convex body. So indeed, everything appears. And uh, coming back to the one million cells, the following holds. If the assumption is satisfied, then with probability one, to every simple D polytope, there are infinitely many cells in the mosaic with, that are combinatorial isomorphic to the given type. Um, the proof, well, uh, it may not be very surprising, it's maybe more surprising that it has never been proved before, as far as we know. Uh, the proof, you might guess, uh, uses the borel cantelli lemma. It, of course, uses some geometric construction. So locally, we can satisfy what we want. And then we satisfy it locally. And we, then we move this local situation far away and repeat it and so on. But hyperplanes are infinite. So we, if we have some situation here and some situation here, there are still hyperplanes which meet both situations. So these both events which interest us cannot be independent, but approximately so. And for that reason, we can use a modification of the borel cantelli lemma, which goes back to Erdős and Reynyi. Um, so we are given a sequence of events on some probability space such that the sum of their probabilities is infinite. And we want to know, we want to conclude that uh, the probability of the limb sub is infinite. So that infinitely many events occur. And now e, i is unequal j. So if they would be pairwise independent, then this would be 0 here. And then we know that this is true by the classical borel cantelli lemma. But the extension of Erdős and Reynyi says if this limit inferior here, so the dominator goes to infinity, if the limit inferior is zero, then the same conclusion is possible. And this is enough to uh, give a proof of uh, the two theorems which I quoted here. So that's all I want to say on this. And now let's, of course, uh, as I said, it may be uh, nice for a geometer, but completely useless to know which polytopes occur here. But still, sometimes to be astonished is maybe not useless. Uh, so the next point now would be typical cells. And I have to remind you, well, no, I don't have to remind you. But nevertheless, uh, <laughs> I have it on my slide. So the, the, the idea is to pick one cell out at random, which cannot be done in the infinite mosaic. but. The, the intuitive idea behind it is we take a very, very large part, so we have finitely many cells, and then we pick out one at random. Say with equal chances, then we would call this a typical phase, but the chances might also be, say, proportional to the volume. Then we get a volume-weighted typical phase, or we can pre-assign any weight function. and. Uh, translation invariant positive measurable function on the k polytopes. And more generally, I say the weighted, the w weighted typical k phase denoted like this is obtained up to translation if we select a k phase of the mosaic at random with chances proportional to the value of w. Uh, 
this is the, the heuristic idea behind that. Of course, this can be made precise either by using grain distributions of stationary particle processes or using palm distributions. Um, I would like to remind you that uh, besides the typical cells, uh, early in the literature was already considered the zero cell. So uh, the almost surely unique cell of the mosaic which contains the origin. And uh, up to translations, this is uh, the volume weighted typical cell in our sense of weighted cells. And Matterau clearly made the distinction between number law and volume law in this case. If we want to deal with the translations, then we can translate any polytope so that some center, some preassigned center function coincides with the origin, for example, the Steiner point. And when we have done this, we have the, I can give you this intuitive interpretation of the weighted typical K phase. What do we do here? We consider a ball of radius R origin zero and look at all K phases of the mosaic. This is a set of K phases, which after translating the Steiner point into the origin, fall into the preassigned set A and we multiply this by the weight function of weight of f. And uh, we take the expectation. And similar in the denominator, we just delete this condition here. And then in the limit for r to infinity, we get, in fact, the probability that the typical weighted k phase uh, is contained in A. So this is an interpretation of the typical weighted K phase, which comes close to the heuristic explanation in the beginning. A very brief, really very brief uh, survey about large cells. Uh, in the early 1940s, David Kendall conjectured that the shape of the zero cell of the random mosaic generated by a stationary isotropic Poisson line process in the plane tends to circularity in some sense, which can be made precise, given that the area of the cell tends to infinity. In this form, this was proved by Kovalenko in 1997. And I give a very, very brief survey about later extensions. The extensions concern higher dimensions, non-isotropic processes, different interpretations of large, and also typical K phases. And uh, the first result in higher dimensions was joint work with Daniel Hook and Matthias Reitzner. And the, for a geometer, of course, the first interesting and maybe most interesting question is, if we give up the isotropy, what, here we had circularity, so this doesn't make sense if we have a non-isotropic process. So what would be the approximate shape of large cells in the non-isotropic case? And the answer is here, we use the, directional distribution to construct a convex body for which this directional distribution is the so-called surface area measure. So of course, uh, according to an old classical theorem of Minkowski, there is a unique, remember this is an even measure, and there is a unique convex body B sub x uh, for which the surface area measure, I assume that this is known for the moment, uh, is equal to the given directional distribution. Uh, for some reason, uh, because it uses the theorem of Minkowski, it's called the Blaschke body. I don't recall <laughs> why, but uh, this is so. Uh, in the following, I would like to denote the uh, zero cell by Z sub zero and the typical cell by Z. Uh, then we need some device to measure the deviation of the, uh, the homothetic deviation of the cell from this uh, Blaschke body. Uh, I don't define it here, but uh, I think it's intuitively clear. There should be zero if the two are homothetic and uh, small if they are close to homothety. And VD is the volume. And um, this is the only formula I, I display here. Under the condition that the volume of the zero cell is at least A, we can say that the probability that the deviation is at least epsilon, 
uh, becomes exponentially small. So when A, the, the bound for the volume, uh, increases, then we have here an exponential decrease of this bound. So this comes closer and closer in homothety. The zero cell comes closer and closer to the Blaschke body. So these are the asymptotic shapes. So what else have we done? Later the same for the uh, volume replaced by kth intrinsic volume, but we could de do this only in the isotropic case. Then with Daniel Hook, we have a ge very general investigation where we consider axiomatically introduced size functionals and find that the limit shapes depend on the solution of certain uh, isoperimetric problems uh, related to uh, the size functionals and to some other functionals. And uh, um, so this is a, a very general solution of the candle problem with several particular cases. Later, which this is all, uh, everything for the zero cell. Later, we considered also the typical cell uh, in the isotropic case. And we considered similar questions for k-dimensional phases, which again is, uh, brings in some new interest from a geometric point of view, because if the process is not isotropic, then uh, the asymptotic shape will, of course, depend on the direction of the face. And uh, how it exactly depends can be found in these two papers. So, But this was only a very brief survey on what has been done on the Kendall problem. Now, point five talks about variances. Let's first talk about vertex numbers. So nobody will doubt that in this case, the vertex number is four. The average vertex number in this case is also four. The, the expected vertex number of the typical polygon is four because every vertex is contained, every vertex is contained in four cells. And there is some double counting argument showing that therefore also every the typical cell must have four vertices. In fact, this holds much more generally. In higher dimensions, the expected vertex number of the typical cell is 2 to the d. And more generally, Josef Meke found that the expected number of j phases of the typical k phase is given by this purely combinatorial number there. And this does not depend on the distribution. It does even not depend on the Poisson assumption. So this is a purely combinatorial result, independent of the distribution. But of course, as the pictures show, this must change drastically if we consider variances, which obviously is zero in this case and obviously is not zero in this case. And here we have to offer, or I have to offer the following theorem. Given a stationary Poisson hyperplane process in RD, and we consider the typical K phase of its induced mosaic, ask for the variance of its vertex number and of course, it's greater or equal to zero, but we have an upper bound. Don't look at this upper bound, only uh, believe me that it's sharp. And this is the fact which is of interest for a geometer, because the um, upper bound is attained in the isotropic case. Not quite only in this case, so if I go on here, equality on the left side, of course, holds if and only if x is a parallel process. Equality on the right side hold if x is isotropic with respect to a suitable scalar product on RD. And uh, for k equal d, it holds only in this case. Um, let me say a few words about the proof, but only in the case for cells. And this gives me the opportunity to recall the associated zonoid, which plays an essential role in the study of non-isotropic hyperplane processes. In this case, we use the directional distribution to construct a function in this way, which as a function of u is a support function, and therefore defines a convex body, p sub x, which was introduced by Georges Materon. And we call it, he called it the Steiner compact. We prefer to call it the associated zonoid. And this is of importance. Oh, yeah, some pictures from the internet. So this is uh, 
or how these bodies look like. I, I should say that this is a zonoid, which means it's a Minkowski sum of segments, sum in the case in the sense of an integral. If the measure phi is discrete, the body will, would be finite sums of segments and look like this. Why is this important? Because for the zero cell, it really doesn't, oh, yeah, it doesn't work. In the, for the zero cell, the expected number of vertices is no longer de independent of the distribution, but it depends in this complicated way on the directional distribution, namely via the associated zonoid. We take this and its volume, we take the polar of the zonoid and its volume, and this so-called volume product is an affine invariant of convex bodies, and this, uh, via this uh, functional, the uh, expected vertex number can be expressed. And for this volume product, there are classical inequalities which yield inequalities for this expected vertex numbers. I mentioned this because this will play a role in a minute. Namely, before considering the second moment, we consider the expectation of any measurable function g times vertex number and can express this by an integral, and here we have a sum. And uh, this is the set of d phases of the mosaic induced by x together with d additional hyperplanes through the origin. Now, these come in because we use Campbell's theorem and then the slivniak mecke formula, and then the stationarity and so on. I go back. Because of the use of the slivniak mecke formula, we have additional hyperplanes here. And now we have to evaluate this integral in the case where the function g is also, is again, the vertex number. And for that reason, we have to count. So the black, the outer black polytope is the zero cell of our hyperplane process. We have additional red hyperplanes through the origin. And we have to count where the, these red hyperplanes dissect the zero cell into smaller polytopes, and we have to count their vertices. And the vertices appear, for example, this would appear in two smaller polytopes, this in four smaller polytopes, and this in eight, and so on. And for that reason, we can count the number of vertices in this way. And if we insert this, so the, the final result is uh, essential. Here we get an expectation of the vertex number of the zero cell, of the zero cell intersected with some intersections of hyperplanes through the origin. So this would be, will be some linear subspace. And in the end, we get in the integrant here, the volume product of the associated zonoid projected to some subspace. And here we can apply the inequalities which I mentioned before. And fortunately, the rest gives one. And so the double inequality uh, is obtained in the end by this procedure. Uh, this can be generalized. Not only I talked only about vertex numbers here. We can replace the typical cell by typical k phases. And the vertex number can be replaced by other functionals like total edge length, surface area, volume, and so on. And we can determine all second moments, all mixed second moments of these functionals by integrals involving the associated zonoid. If in the end we specialize this to the isotropic case, we get this formula, which is an old formula of miles. And I was happy when I specialized the general result that I got the same formula. So there was high probability that both of us did not make a mistake. There was a small probability that we both made the same mistake, but hope, let's go with the high probability. So this was about variances, where I picked out only variances of vertex numbers, but much more can be done here. I would like, come, uh, would like to come to my last point. And uh, let me start with a quotation from some paper. So 
Recently, there has been increased interest in random polyhedral cones. And for example, the blue question here, when does a randomly oriented cone strike a fixed cone? This is verbally quoted from this paper by McCoy and Tropp. And you see there appears demixing in the title and foundations of computational mathematics in the journal. So this comes from a slightly different direction, but uh, is of course a question which uh, should interest us. And uh, various aspects of the question have recently been considered by the authors listed here. But perhaps you would like to know what the question really means. And so uh, I give a precise formulation. We consider two closed convex polyhedral cones, not both of them subspaces, and a uniform random rotation, so a random element of the rotation group, SOD, with distribution given by the normalized Haar measure. The question, which was posed, asked for the probability of a non-trivial intersection of the fixed cone and the rotated cone. So cones always have the origin in common, of course, but non-trivial intersection would be more than the origin. So this is the question, the probability of the intersection uh, of the fixed cone and the rotated, randomly rotated cone to be different from the origin. Uh, we can also consider, uh, instead of cones, consider intersections with the unit sphere. And uh, I would like to mention here that as early as 1896, if you look into Henri Poincaré's book Calcul des Probabilités, Probabilité on page 118, you will find the following question. He considered a fixed and a moving curve on the two sphere and asked for the expected number of their intersection points. And he found that it's proportional to the product of the length of the two curves. So it's an old question. And in our case, for the general polyhedral cones, what do we need to answer this question? Well, we need the conic intrinsic volumes, the spherical kinematic formula, and the spherical gauss bonnet formula. I have enough time to explain this very briefly. The conic intrinsic volumes are the spherical or conic counterparts to the classical intrinsic volumes. A very short approach goes as follows. Uh, we define the K skeleton of the polyhedral cone, C, by uh, considering the relative interiors of all k-dimensional phases, and then considering a standard Gaussian random vector in RD, and we can define the kth conic intrinsic volume just as the probability that the nearest, the, the metric projection of G onto the cone falls into the k-skeleton. So this P now is the, uh, it's written there, is the nearest point map or metric projection of C. Or uh, in terms of uh, external angles, it looks like in the classical case, a sum where we have here an internal angle and an external angle, and in this way uh, introduced by Peter McMullen a long time ago. On the sphere, we would have here an internal angle, which is just the spherical volume of this face of the spherical polytope, and the external angle of the cone or of the spherical polytope at this point is, of course, the same. So we see that we have the exact counterparts of the Euclidean intrinsic volumes here. Then we need the spherical or conic kinematic formula, which says that the expectation of the kth intrinsic volume of C and the intersection with the random cone is given by such a bilinear expression, similar to those we have seen before. And, uh, well, this, of course, goes back to Santa Law in the differential geometric case and was uh, in the convex case for curvature measures also studied by Stefan Glasauer. But we didn't ask for the expectation of the intrinsic volume, but for the probability of a non-trivial intersection, so for the expectation of the indicator function of this uh, event here. And in Euclidean space, it helps that the intrinsic volume V0 is nothing but the Euler characteristic, which is not true in spherical case. But there is another version of the gauss bonnet theorem. And it tells us that if C is not a subspace, uh, 
here's a polyhedral cone, C, which is not a subspace, then this sum of certain intrinsic volumes is one. And for that reason, we can insert this linear combination for the Euler characteristic and get this probability in the end. So a complicated expression, in, but again, in terms of conic intrinsic volumes of the two. Now, this is all classical. My, my problem or my, my question was the following. Uh, the conic kinematic formula expresses the probability of a non-trivial intersection of a fixed cone with a random cone. But the random cone is of very special type. It's just obtained by applying a random rotation to a fixed cone. And it would be a natural question of the, whether there are any models of random cones, reasonable models, tractable ones, where also the shape is random, but that allow for an explicit determination of the corresponding intersection probability. And uh, I tell you that so-called random Schläfli cones provide such a model. Now, what is that? Um, if we consider n hyperplanes to the origin in general position, then space is divided into precisely this given number of cones. And this was proved by Schläfli, extending the uh, formula of Steiner, older formula in lower dimensions by Steiner. And uh, <clears throat> for that reason, we call these cones Schläfli cones. And now make this random, take n independent random hyperplanes through the origin with isotropic distribution for the moment and pick out at random one of the, with equal chances, one of the induced polyhedral cones. And this gives us the isotropic random Schläfli cone. And here is the theorem. So the Schläfli cones provide such a model. Uh, in, instead of the rotated fixed cone, we have, we have now a, a random cone, which can have also a random shape, but we have a similar formula, of course, now on the right-hand side, appearing only the conic intrinsic volumes of C, and the parameter n of which this depends uh, appears there in a combinatorial way. Now, to prove this, uh, we need that this has an isotropic distribution, and we need the expectations of the intrinsic volumes. So for the proof, we need the expected conic intrinsic volumes. But fortunately, these have been determined before with several other expectations and second moments in a joint paper with Daniel Hook. I should mention that this is an old topic, but not uh, maybe half forgotten namely the expected numbers of K phases were determined much earlier in a paper by Cover and Efron. And what we did, we considered more general functionals. Uh, so these is here formulated for the intersections with the spheres. So this would be vertex numbers of the spherical polytopes or total edge lengths or surface area or volume and so on. And so for all of these, we determined the expectations for the Schläfli cones and also for the polars. So the first the one is due to Cover and Efron. And here we have what we need for the intersection formula. And uh, here in the end, we have the general expectations. You see this, well, I've written here, this does not need the isotropy assumptions. We can use more general distributions. Again, this is purely combinatorial. But this again changes drastically if we consider second moments, of course. And here are some second moments of the functionals which are just introduced. All mixed second moments can be determined explicitly in this way. And this is the exact spherical analog, spherical or conical analog to the old formula of uh, Roger Miles. And with this, I would like to conclude and thank for your attention.